South Sudan remains precariously poised on the brink of an abyss. The promises of the new state for peace, justice, and opportunity have been squandered. I'm appalled by the scale of sexual violence documented by our human rights teams. We demand accountability for all atrocities and the leaders of South Sudan to commit to the peace process. Poised on the brink of an abyss, South Sudan descended into chaos earlier this month as the peace deal signed less than a year ago collapsed. After fighting erupted outside the presidential compound, the first vice president, Riek Mashar, has fled the capital. But now President Salva Kiir has replaced him with Taban Dengai in a move that some believe could push the state back into civil war. So with Mashar missing in action, can peace be restored to the world's youngest nation? And what exactly happened to put South Sudan back on the brink? I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. Now, South Sudan's new vice president has promised to do everything he can to bring peace to the country. Taban Dengai has been sworn in, formally replacing opposition leader Riek Mashar. Riek Mashar, whose whereabouts are still unknown, claims his rival president, Salva Kiir, is trying to have him killed. CCTV's Patrick Oyet has more. Just three months ago, Riek Mashar was sworn in as first vice president. He's now been replaced by his chief negotiator and former mining minister, Tabanden Gai. The move indicates tensions within the opposition, but President Kiir has downplayed the issue, saying the implementation of the 2015 peace deal must continue with or without Machar. Of course, this agreement cannot be personalized that if X is away the agreement will be held until when that person comes. Then Guy, who is now the commander in chief of the opposition's armed forces, says his responsibility is towards the thousands of South Sudanese who have been displaced from their homes. I will struggle to bring you out from the suffering of the You don't deserve to be displaced in your own country. The Joint Monitoring and Evaluation Commission, which oversees the implementation of the African Union-backed peace deal, is prepared to work with Dengai. If the I.O. agree among themselves, they make proposals to the president and he accepts, uh, we wel welcome that. The new vice president has also promised to negotiate Riek Machar's return. However, Machar has refused to come back to Juba until neutral force of African Union troops is deployed in the country, something President Kiir is dead set against. Patrick Oyet, CCTV, Juba, South Sudan. Now, in the wake of the fresh political unrest, I spoke to South Sudan's ambassador and permanent representative to the African Union, James Petier Morgan, on the sidelines of the recent African Union summit. He assessed the situation as well as South Sudan's commitment to its citizens. Ambassador Morgan, thank you very much for your time. Uh, first of all, let's start by uh, you giving us an analysis of exactly what is happening uh, in South Sudan at the moment because there is a lot of regional concern following the latest flare-up of violence. Uh, thank you very much once again. Uh, uh, what I want to tell you today is that uh, South Sudan is calm following the clashes that took place. Our president came out and ordered every soldier to go back to the barracks. And since then, we have never heard anything again. It is quiet as we speak. There are th three issues also that uh, IGAD uh, proposed, and um, one of them was an immediate, imposing an immediate arms embargo on uh, South Sudan and enacting additional targeted sanctions on leaders and uh, commanders who 
have been unraveling the peace process. What's your view on that? That proposal came from the UN Secretary General. And for, for us, that thing was not new. Because even 2000, from 2005, the United Nations Security Council had been talking about sanctions. So we see, we see that that was not fair. What, what is the reason of sanctioning South Sudan? And what is the reason of putting targeted sanctions on our leaders? They're working to implement the peace. Now, if you are going to sanction them, how will they work with their colleagues in the region, the continent, and the beyond? There's no need for sanctioning anybody our leaders. Our leaders are committed to implement this peace. And first and foremost, this is the first accident. And we, as the people of South Sudan, and as the government, we feel that calling for sanctions and calling for embargo because of this kind of accident is not justifiable, it is premature, and it is uncalled for because this peace has been put for 30 months. So this is the first accident. And if you start doing this at the first accident, and we don't know what lies ahead, we are human beings. We are, we are prone to make mistakes. So we really call even the member, the Security Council, the UN Security Council. Of course, here, the, our brothers in the continent, they understand. Because the problem is you know, that it is only in South Sudan. All of these countries in this continent, we have gone through these difficulties. So we really appeal to the members of the Security Council who are always talking about sanctions. This one, they want to destroy everything in that young country. So we, we call them that this is the first accident. Let them just watch and see whether we, we will succeed. We need them to help us to succeed. What is South Sudan's commitment now from its leaders? What is South Sudan's commitment to IGAD, member states, to the region, uh, to the African continent and to the international community and more importantly to its own South Sudanese nationals. This is our commitment that the region should know that the peace that was signed, it was they who prepared it and our commitment that we sign it. We would have rejected that, first of all, we didn't negotiate it to be this way. But once we sign it, that was our commitment to the region and the region should know that we are for them and we listen to what they tell us because we are a young nation and we need their guidance. So that is why the, 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 the peace agreement itself called the, propose, I mean the compromise peace agreement was not based on what we wanted. But once they told us that this is the way forward, we didn't hesitate, we signed it. But the president said the peace was, he was having reservation on one thing. Because when we were signing the peace, the rebel movement by then was already split. So the president appealed to his colleagues that, look, most of you in the region had been soldiers. And you know when a movement like this is split, there will be no commitment from the other side because the side that broke away may continue to fight because they are not part of this command anymore. And those, those reservations were, were denied. That No, no, no. So the president said, OK, if that's the case, let us go ahead. And now, as we speak, I think the world has to prove the president right because he, he, uh, he said earlier that when the rebel movement split and signing peace with one faction and there was another faction led by Peter Gadet, he knew that this was going to be problematic and he told his brothers here in the region that this is my reservation. It will be a problem problematic and, and now it has happened. So. We are committed to this region, we are committed to listen to them and let them also listen to us because at the end of the day, the peace ends with the people of South Sudan. And it is the people of South Sudan who will be the beneficiary. And we need peace in the first place. We really need peace. And let the region help guide us as we accepted to sign the peace, which they made it as a compromise peace agreement. We didn't refuse, we signed it. Ambassador Morgan, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now, IGAD has been central in efforts to reinstate lasting peace in South Sudan. The regional body steered efforts leading to the signing of the peace agreement in August of last year. I spoke to IGAD's Executive Secretary, Ambassador Mahbub Malim, to find out their response to the latest unrest.
Brother Malim, thank you very much for your time. Uh, let's start with the situation in South Sudan because IGAD was a, a major facilitator in the peace process in, in, in South Sudan. Assess that situation for us today following the latest flare-up of violence. Uh, j just like anybody else, um, we are also really dismayed about what, uh, what seems to have happened in uh, South Sudan. Uh, realizing the fact that uh, South Sudanese have been fighting, have fought for about 50 years in two batches of 25 years until the signing of the CPA in 2005. And then the peace held for a while. And then we all celebrated the much hyped uh, referendum uh, to which they, to the man, almost 100%, voted for independence. Then we celebrated the independence. So if there is something that everybody else was sure, just as we are, that was not going to happen, was that uh, South Sudan, Republic of South Sudan, was going to go through another cycle of violence. But, uh, towards the end of May, early June, I was there myself. I met the president, I met the first vice president, I met uh, several uh, ministers of foreign affairs. And um, despite the fact that, you know, the operationalization of uh, agreements has its own naturally teething problems, uh, nothing seemed to be extraordinary at the time. Right, but, but, but in terms of uh, IGAD's position on this latest flare-up of violence, uh, how worried are IGAD member states and what is IGAD's proposal? Well, IGAD is um, not actually worried by, uh, as such. Uh, they, they, they are seriously concerned. And I can tell you that um, IGAD will not accept, uh, will not condone. This will not continue. Uh, we had um, uh, an urgent ministerial meeting uh, in Nairobi, uh, there is a communique where about seven demands uh, were made, uh, and if the demands are not met, there, there are specific recommendations that have been made, including the reconfiguration of the mandate of ANMIS and um, the the proposal to have expanded uh, membership through uh, levels of, of ANMIS from the region. Uh, so I see that as a very very serious, uh, you know, um, uh, stand uh, from our point of view. Right, uh, Ambassador, thank you very much. We're going to take a short break now, but when we come back, we'll have expert analysis on the situation inside South Sudan. To stay with us. including our friends in the ECA, our friends in AU, our friends in UN, and in the international community as a whole. We have not done this illegally, not we, it is the IO, they have not done this illegally, and we in the government headed by our president is only in respect of the will of the IO and also in accordance with this agreement. So where are we going? That was the second vice president of South Sudan, James Wani Iga, defending the appointment of Teban Dengai as the new first vice president. Welcome back to Talk Africa. Now to further offer an analysis on the situation in Juba, I have expert guests standing by. In London, Professor Alex Diwal, he's the executive director of the World Peace Foundation. In Nairobi, political commentator Professor Masharia Munene. And with me here in studio is Vincent Kimosop. He's a policy analyst at Sovereign uh, Group. Welcome and thank you for joining us on the uh, program. Uh, Professor Diwal, I'm going to start off with you there. First, uh, give us your impression on the developments inside uh, South Sudan. There is a new first vice president that has been appointed. What do you make of the developments? I, I don't think it should be taken that seriously. I think what it is, it's, it, it's another effort by uh, President Salva Kiir and the people around him to uh, maintain a pretense of normality. In fact, what we've had in, in the last uh, couple of weeks is really a major move by the president and the people around him to dismantle what uh, was left really of the very fragile uh, peace agreement that was um, enforced on him, uh, arm twisted on him by the international community uh, la last August. This is not going to solve any problems in South Sudan. It's just a prelude to a, a, a further intensification of political differences and, and armed conflict. 
Uh, Vincent, do you think uh, those developments are going to exacerbate the already uh, deplorable situation there? Um, yes. Um, I th we need to... Uh, the former president of the uh, United States, uh, Jimmy Carter, once said that you do not make peace with your friends, you make peace with your enemies. Uh, and it's not good to build uh, walls but build bridges. So I think what we are seeing with uh, President Salva Kiir is really an unfortunate development considering the very precarious nature of the peace situation in South Sudan. Uh, what this therefore will do is that it will alienate the very people it needs to bring closer. What South Sudan needed was a leader like Nelson Mandela, somebody who was going to transcend beyond the division and inspire the nation. Uh, so because of the uh, tribal nature of our politics, the uh, divisive nature of politics in Africa, what you've seen is that it's actually exploited that situation to entrench uh, the system. And what I can tell you is that uh, things are actually moving to the south in South Sudan. Done. Professor Diwala, I'll come back to you though. I, I, and looking back at how South Sudan has gotten itself into this position because it, it just recently announced uh, that a peace deal and stability were finally there for the country. UN Secretary General Ban Ki moon did say that South Sudan is now staring into an abyss. How did it get there? Well, I think the fundamental problem with the peace agreement that was. Um, uh, forced on the parties last August was that it set the political clock back to the day before the war began. And what it therefore didn't address was the reasons why that war began and escalated in the way it did. So there was a political conflict, competition between President Salva Kiir and several other rivals, prominent among whom, he wasn't the only one, but he was the most prominent, was his former Vice President Riyak Mashar. They couldn't resolve that, that, that conflict uh, politically. Uh, and one of the reasons they couldn't do that was that the strategy that the president had adopted over the previous years was what he called the big tent strategy of bringing everybody into the government. And the way he did that was by using all the revenue of government, and it was a fairly substantial revenue, to allow them to, to, to eat at the same trough. There was a massively corrupt system, a massive spending, particularly on the payroll for the military for more than 700 generals, etc. And that money was running out due to mismanagement and the low price of oil. So the political conflict that would have been settled by simply allowing people to be um, corrupt and satisfy themselves couldn't be managed in that way. And then, as soon as the conflict um, turned violent, the army split along ethnic lines. And the reason for that was the army was not a unified, professional, institutionalized army. Rather, it was a collection and alliance of ethnic militia, each of the units loyal to its commander only. So that whenever there was a conflict of whatever nature, be it political, be it ethnic or whatever, it would inevitably take an ethnic turn. Now the problem was that the, the agreement did not resolve those problems. It did not uh, resolve the political competition, it simply postponed it. It right. did not provide resources and in fact South Sudan was now completely bankrupt. There was no money to pay anybody and above all the most fundamental problem was that it entrusted the security of the capital city Juba to the forces of the two contenders which were bitterly unreconciled, bitterly opposed to each other. It was an insane idea and it was only a matter of time before violence broke out, as indeed happened just a couple of weeks ago. Vincent, is that how you see it though, that the, the peace deal, the way it was structured in itself, uh, was not really going to hold up to its task? Um, I think if we had uh, the political goodwill, as I was pointing out earlier, that uh, uh, it's actually an indictment on the leadership uh, strength of uh, President Salva Kiir. If, uh, if he, he wanted to inspire and to move his country forward, I believe with uh, uh, political goodwill can actually help move a lot of, uh, uh, help uh, the, the situation uh, and ensure that uh, Salva Kiir together with Mashar uh, uh, work towards an amicable solution. Because th th it's, there is resources also there. Uh, then we also have interest groups that the two groups uh, represent. So when you have political will coming from the president himself, things would actually be uh, better than it is and I agree with him that uh, because of ethnicity uh, 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 not having a professional army that actually did not make things better but even worse because if you talk to and I wish we'd, we had uh, a representative of, of Mashar here you would actually point out that Mashar is also being driven by interests so uh, this interest needs to be challenged uh, or actually be addressed not fully uh, but in a way that we 
we keep the peace because uh, the, the South Sudan today is in a worse situation. Actually, it's unfortunate that six years down the line, uh, many South Sudanese are living in more precarious situation, unlike even before uh, the country was born. Let me draw in uh, Professor Masharia Munene here and, and also get your views on what's going on inside uh, South Sudan. Now, Professor, from the outset there, it looks like uh, President Salva Kiir and the SPLM in opposition uh, with the appointment of uh, Taban Dengai are in tandem, are in agreement. Has this development, though, started to bring or push South Sudan forward finally? The development in Southern Sudan, uh, to start with, very unfortunate because the world expected better of them than what we have witnessed in the last few years, uh, not to mention the last few months. One, the people, the leadership of Southern Sudan uh, would appear as if it never learned from the mistakes of the rest of the African countries because they had time to learn. Uh, before they be, uh, became independent. It appears also that there is a lot of selfish, uh, selfishness involved uh, driving all the factions towards war instead of towards peace. And uh, what we've noticed in the recent times is power play in such a way that um, the appointment of a new deputy president, uh, while the other one is still saying that he is the deputy president without being in the, center, in the seat of power, uh, it's kind of comical in itself. And uh, it is a shame to the leadership of the, the political leadership of Southern Sudan, whether it's on the side of uh, the president or the former deputy president, uh, they need to get the act together because they don't have it. Right. Professor Diwal, then, uh, uh, from what we've just heard, then, from uh, all the experts on this panel, it seems that South Sudan is in a dire situation now. So. Exactly how divided, though, is the opposition? What is going to happen now with South Sudan? What is the way forward here? I think the initiative no longer can be entrusted to the South Sudanese political elite. It's, it's fairly clear. They've had several chances of sorting out their, their political differences and putting their country on the track towards democracy, development, peace and security, and they've failed. The African Union uh, two years ago had a commission of inquiry into human rights violations which found that all sides during the recent war committed war crimes and crimes against humanity. Now the same actors with the same units are now fighting the same war. It would be naive to suppose they would do anything other than commit war crimes and crimes against humanity and indeed we are seeing that. There has essentially been a coup against the, the, the constitutional order, fragile though it was. Now this gives two reasons why the African Union, the neighboring states, should intervene, should send forces in order to protect civilians and in order to restore some progress towards the, uh, uh, a constitutional order and, and democracy. So I think the initiative now lies not with the, the South Sudanese leadership but with the, the African leadership that has indeed uh, decided that it would make ready forces from neighboring countries and from Rwanda and elsewhere in, in, in Africa to, to provide a, a force intervention brigade to go in, protect the civilians of Juba, demilitarize uh, the city, and, and, and ensure that the peace process can be put back on track. And I right. think that is where the initiative must now lie. Uh, Professor Masharia, though, with that argument, South Sudan is, itself has rejected a regional force to go into uh, uh, South Sudan. It, it, would, would that have been the way to go, though? And, and what is the political and the humanitarian impact of South Sudan's rejection of that regional force? It would uh, likely exacerbate the situation. We expect to see more refugees filtering into the neighboring countries like Uganda and Kenya, uh, which in itself is a burden to those countries. But it also appears to be ill-advised, the rejection of the a force to come and be kind of an, a buffer zone between the two sides so as they can have time to rethink uh, themselves and cool down the temperatures. So the outright rejection of the suggestion uh, can mean that the situation will intensify for the worse, which is not a very good uh, picture. It also raises the question of the capacity of the neighboring countries to intervene on humanitarian grounds because uh, it requires a lot of resources, it requires political will, it requires commitment, and sometimes we may be, may be asked whether the countries concerned have all those uh, capacities 
in order to do an effective job of helping Southern Sudan to redeem itself from itself. Right. Uh, Vincent, is that the way to go, though, a regional force for South Sudan now? Um, yes. Uh, and on top of that, I think the UN Security Council should pass a resolution, possibly uh, sanctioning the two uh, leading lights, uh, because that will put pressure on them, because they hold the future and the destiny of the country together. And then also the possibility of uh, uh, holding those who've committed international crimes accountable. I know Africa's experience with the ICC looking at the Kenyan context might not be a rosy one, but uh, it is people need to be held accountable. Uh, these are lives, and we've had the experience of Rwanda, Burundi. Uh, things have to be, so we cannot allow South Sudan to go uh, the way it is going. Uh, so combine local solution together with international solution so that uh, South, South Sudan is salvaged because truly it is uh, tinkering on the precipice of, uh, of, of destruction and this must be stopped. Right. Uh, Professor Diwal, you did uh, start the conversation about uh, now being a regional problem and no longer a, a problem for the South Sudan government on its own. But South Sudan has uh, rejected the proposal by the regional group IGA to send in a regional force. What next then? I think the, the route to agreement in Juba lies through Kampala. Uh, the, if the, the government of Uganda, if President Museveni were to uh, advise President Kiir to cooperate with the region, and indeed if President Museveni were to himself become part of that regional solution, I don't think the, the objections would be sustained. I think that uh, the government of South Sudan would then have no option but to comply with that intervention. Now there's no question that it would be a difficult and long-term intervention, but uh, I think we have reached the point that there is really no option but for the region to take a, a leading role in providing essential security for the, uh, the capital city of South Sudan and the citizens who live there and thereby providing the space for uh, some form of democracy to move forward in South Sudan. Right, uh, Professor Mashare Munene, how do you see this situation now unfolding in coming days, in coming weeks, in coming months? The, it may be necessary for any country that feels strong enough and have capacity to discuss forthrightly with both uh, Savakyu and Mashar and say that these are the, put the cards on the table. This is what's going to happen because the countries are not expected to watch a situation deteriorate to a point where it is uh, a no-return uh, position. So I think uh, we ask the neighboring countries to talk uh, direct to the leadership and just tell them that things are not good for them. I would not go the way of saying that the ICC should come in, given that the ICC has failed uh, in its previous attempts to do anything right. So um, it would not be even be encouraging. These are not the people to be threatened with ICC things. So they need uh, some other tactic, but no threats about ICC. And that's all we have time for this week. But thank you to my guests for their insights. In London, Professor Alex Dewal, he's the executive director of the World Peace Foundation. In Nairobi, political commentator, Professor Masharia Monene. And with me here in a studio, Vincent Kimosop. He's a policy an analyst at a Sovereign Insight. Thank you very much for joining us on Talk Africa. And remember, you can continue this conversation with us online through Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And do join us again next week for another edition of Talk Africa. Goodbye.